Let's begin. Um, I'm Saikat Guha, uh, the College of Optical Sciences. It's a real pleasure and honor to welcome today's colloquium speaker, Professor Prem Kumar. Um, so Prem is one of the world leaders of quantum optics, and I mean, you can read his uh, resume and the, all the emails that you have gotten. I don't need to tell you about that. He's a professor at uh, EC department at uh, Northwestern University. Um, but one thing I would say about Prem, so I've known Prem for more than 15 years now. First, as a graduate student when I was at MIT, uh, my advisor, Jeff Shapiro, was good friends with Prem. We worked on programs um, together. And after that, Prem went to DARPA and then now back at Northwestern. He was one of the uh, rare physicists I've seen who is a very, very thorough physicist, but at the same time, a true engineer at heart. And I, I hope you will see some of that in his, in his lecture today. So Prem is well known for his work on uh, generation and manipulation of quantum light, generation of squeezed light, uh, single photons, um, and uh, manipulation of light using parametric amplifiers and analysis of those building them. And uh, Prem went to DARPA after his uh, long tenure at Northwestern University, and there he managed a program portfolio that was more than $20 million, and he started programs ranging all the way from uh, fundamental limits of photon detection to uh, neuroscience and to use of non-classical and non-standard sources of light in biological imaging applications to all sorts of very, very fascinating projects. And I don't think Prem is going to talk about this today, but um, there was a very interesting work he did on discovering quantum effects in biological environments, which is really fascinating, which I think came out of a really old DARPA program on this topic. It was a very interesting work. It's featured on his website. I would encourage you to read that. Um, so I was uh, wanted to tell you when we were having lunch today, I, um, I see some faces from my class here, and we were talking about uh, Dolina receivers and uh, receivers like that in my last class, and some of the students asked, how do you implement those fast all optical and electro-optical switches, and else I told them you will hear from the world leader on that topic tomorrow. So without further ado, I'll let you give the lecture. Let's welcome Professor Prem Kumar. Yeah, I think it's on. Uh, thank you, Sakat, uh, and thank you, Tom, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to come here and tell you a little bit about uh, some work, uh, I have to admit this work is somewhat dated because as when I was gone at DARPA for four years, uh, uh, there are some new things at the end. Students continue to, to work, uh, uh, but you know, the program kind of uh, had its attrition. In any case, uh, I, I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about this quantum internet that everybody talks about. Uh, and what what do we what do we mean by that? What do we need to have to get there, uh, at least at a very high level up front? And then some of the tools and technologies that um, uh, uh, I had tried to engineer uh, back in 2003. Actually, I started a company to engineer the quantum. And and, and you will see some of that along the way. Uh, but we're far away from this notion of uh, a truly a quantum internet, but there is interesting payoffs if we do get there. Uh, so with that uh, remarks, uh, let me uh, move on. And uh, so here's sort of the outline. Uh, I'll talk about why we need these quantum switches. You can think of them as kind of uh, one by two uh, or two by two crossbar switches that we are we know in any communications network these are the heart of uh, as you make connections and break connections and then uh, uh, of course uh, we need to do that those for traffic that's flowing on these that may have what we call entanglement and when you do switch these uh, or you make these kind of uh, routes. Uh, you need to preserve those properties. Those entanglement properties may be entangled with something else that has nothing to do with this. Okay, so that's where the challenges are. And, uh, uh, and there is some motivation. And then we did take an approach to create entanglement preserving switches. Uh, and there are, I'm sure there are other approaches. There are brute force approaches. Uh, and this one relied on 
the ability to get very high speed switches and you'll see some of that and then uh, a, a couple of examples of their use that we've uh, implemented in the lab. So that's sort of the outline but before I get to the outline I want to give a very high level overview for the students here as to you know what we mean by this quantum communication. You know, how does uh, so we all know classical communications very well. Uh, we have a sender and a receiver, generally called Alice and Bob. The classical information, uh, this line, think of it as a register in any device you're using. Could be your cell phone, could be any, any uh, computing device you have. Classically, each of these bits can only be in a, a level zero or level one. Could be a voltage level, could be in... in optical communication, it could be the position, it could be, there are many modulation formats you can use. And then uh, uh, Bob has similar device, the goal is to communicate the string of bits here uh, to Bob. And in the late 1940s, dating back long ago, Claude Shannon showed that uh, no matter what the characteristics of this connecting channel. This channel could be optical, could be wireless, could be anything. That it is possible to maintain error-free communication below a certain channel capacity. Took a long time to devise codes and various things to do this efficiently, but nevertheless the existence proof has been there for a long time. So one can ask, what instead of a classical bit, I have a quantum bit, and here I'm representing a quantum bit by this so-called Schrodinger's cat, uh, which is uh, simultaneously could be uh, in a superposition state, uh, you know, people joke about it as live and dead, simultaneously live and dead cat, for example, and so each of these bits are these quantum bits. They could be photons, uh, your eigenbasis could be uh, vertical horizontal polarizations, they could be time bins, uh, a photon being measured at one location, one time slot, another time slot. Uh, there could be many other uh, appropriate uh, properties uh, of, of the, the light field. And you ask the question, if I have a string of bits whose states I do not know, because in the end I imagine this string, this register to be the output of a quantum computer. So there is, uh, imagine I'm trying to connect two pieces of a quantum computer together. So there is a, a, a certain register whose state needs to be connected in some way to another register. Then can something like this naively be extended to the quantum domain? And one finds that if you ask that can I do something similar uh, like in the classical case, you run into conflict with quantum mechanics. Turns out that if you did indeed succeed in doing this, you will have two copies of the same state. So you violate this no cloning theorem. The linearity of quantum mechanics is very easy to show that uh, if you are given an unknown quantum state, you cannot duplicate that. And for the students, if you Google no cloning theorem, you will get a page and it's very easy, so simple linear, uh, linear algebra, first year quantum mechanics to, to show that indeed that is true. You can also say, okay, we do in fax machines, we can read out, convert it into classical information and recreate that with a machine at the other end, sort of like Star Trek, you know, okay. Can I do that? So can I measure and resend? And you find that you have difficulty with this Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The two arguments are not somewhat orthogonal, but nevertheless, they point to the difficulty of straightforwardly extending these kind of notions naively into the quantum domain. Of course, a while back in the early 90s, a solution to this problem was worked out. Uh, by these Bennett and, and co-workers uh, which, which theorized that if you have between Alice and Bob a new resource and this resource was termed entanglement, if Alice and Bob share an entangled pair of bits, let's call that a one ebit of entanglement, then Alice can make a measurement, a joint measurement on the qubit she wants to send to Bob and her half of the entangled 
bit that she has. That's a two-qubit system. She makes a uh, so-called Bell state measurement, gets two classical bits of information. When that information is classically communicated to Bob, Bob can use that information to turn his half of the entangled bit into exactly the state that Alice's qubit uh, was in. In the process, you avoid those difficulties. Alice has no information now on uh, what's left behind in her possession, and Bob has the exactly the same qubit. So this process was called teleportation. And so over the years, this kind of a uh, quantum communication teleportation process uh, has become absolutely important if you need to connect different, uh, differently located quantum systems. So you can think of quantum communication as sending quantum information between two or more uh, quantum nodes. Uh, and then uh, quantum information processing, of course, is, uh, is manipulating a, uh, a register of qubits uh, with each other to execute some kind of a quantum algorithm. And in that sense, uh, teleportation can be thought of as a wiring between different uh, quantum logic gates and nodes. So this is kind of a high-level uh, intro to what we mean by, by quantum communication. So this immediately says that the problem of uh, having, uh, doing quantum communication via this teleportation is that you need to have this entanglement resource that needs to be available to anyone who wants to do quantum communication. So the problem is actually not uh, that so, so you need to create technologies that are readily create entanglement or distribute entanglement between remote parties who, wants to, who want to communicate. So in, in a sense, then, you, you swept to say one problem and created another one. How do we have a universal re resource that's uh, available to everybody who wants to do quantum communication? And not only that, there are two requirements that one, one needs to, to meet. That this source should produce copious amounts of entangled pairs at high rate. And secondly, as they are distributed from your source to Alice and Bob, they maintain the fidelity that entanglement is not degraded. And it seems like a tall order, but recently, over the years, a number of uh, uh, approaches have been, have been followed. So the early results were in this so-called Chi-2 systems. Uh, these are uh, bulk crystals or waveguides which uh, have parametric, spontaneous parametric down conversion process. So essentially, a photon, a high frequency photon through the nonlinearity of the crystal splits it into two photons in the process because of energy time conservation or uh, momentum position conservation, you can create various different types of entanglement between those two daughter photons. My group focused on these telecom band kind of systems because I was interested in more engineering systems. Uh, and of course, uh, later on, uh, atomic ensembles were, have also been considered uh, as resources because you do want what we call quantum memories. You want to store quantum information into uh, some kind of a uh, what has been in the community called a stationary qubit that doesn't fly around like a photon, uh, moves at the speed of light. Uh, and those lifetime of those states are very long, so you need narrowband photons that uh, need to be generated in order to interface that, uh, to create that light matter interface. So those systems have been, uh, have been talked about. And recently, uh, you may have seen in the news that the Chinese uh, launched a satellite. This happened uh, two years ago. And in that satellite, they actually have a source that was developed as part of uh, a program that Saika, I don't know if that was before you or uh, certainly Franco Wang was uh, a, a part of that. This kind of a, a source based on a Sonyak loop and spontaneous parametric down conversion in a periodically posed, pulled potassium titanium phosphate waveguide, actually not a waveguide, it's a bulk crystal, uh, that uh, is, is going around the Earth in this satellite. And recently, they managed to show that you can have entanglement between 
two stations that are, uh, that are about 1,200 kilometers apart. So these, this kind of entanglement has been engineered. It has been launched into space. Uh, and uh, you can do uh, Bell's inequality kind of violations to show that these two photons that got detected 1,200 kilometers apart uh, are entangled. So a lot is happening in, in, in this area. And uh, so with that uh, uh, background, I want to talk a little bit about what my group has focused on. Uh, again, our motivation was for engineering it for the telecom uh, world. And we started out actually uh, creating, uh, let me just go through this, uh, creating uh, a new kind of a source, uh, not with spontaneous parametric down conversion, uh, but to my surprise, uh, in, in, the, in the late, till the late 90s, uh, people never considered spontaneous fovea mixing. Uh, that uh, there's a lot of work in the literature on modulation instabilities, uh, that if you pump optical fibers, all of a sudden these waves build up, but nobody thought about the quantum analog of that. And in fact, it was clear to us through some experiments we were doing has uh, nothing to do with uh, uh, creating entangled photon pairs, but trying to create optical parametric amplifiers that would have bandwidths larger than the erbium bandwidth. So that was the motivation. And um, uh, back when uh, um, the telecom industry was having a downturn, uh, a guy named Robert Windler at Bell Labs sent us some of these microstructure fibers, and we started playing around with those. And it was clear when we made parametric amplifiers with them that there would be these so-called sidebands appearing. And the question was then, you know, what is this origin of this light? And if, if I looked deeply quantum mechanically, or if I did measurements that could resolve this light at the single photon level, would we find correlations? And indeed, that turned out to be the case. And uh, the first results on this were published in this paper, and then later on, turning this uh, uh, energy time entanglement into polarization entanglement was published later. What we really showed was that the spontaneous fovea mixing is essentially equivalent to spontaneous parametric down conversion. You can think of it this way that when light is passing through, uh, at the fundamental level, the, the fiber absorption is way in the ultraviolet somewhere. So you're far off resonance. In the case of, uh, and the same holds true in the crystals as well. So you are uh, very highly non-resonant nonlinearity. In the case of crystals, uh, if the phase matching conditions are built up right, there is a strong probability amplitude for creating photon pairs in, uh, along certain uh, preferred directions or preferred frequencies or preferred modes, so to speak. Same can be done in fibers, uh, and particularly if you can achieve phase matching. For us at the time, it was easier to be in this modulation instability regime and through experiments, one could show that these signal and idler actually have the same kind of correlation properties, and they, uh, they go into the non-classical regime. And what I want to uh, focus on is how to turn that into polariza polarization entanglement. <coughs> so, so the experiments are, are work something like this. So you take a piece of fiber, you pump it, and the signal is there for alignment purposes. Uh, when the actual spontaneous fovea mixing is taking place, there is no signal here. Okay. So imagine that you have this pulse, and typical parameters are something like this. So it's in the telecom band, and this is a pulse about uh, uh, 5 picosecond transform limited that translates over 1 nanometer in, in wavelength bandwidth, in terms of wavelength. You start with a pulse. You send it through some kind of polarization optics so that 
it has equal intensities along horizontal and vertical. It could be linear, it could be circular. And then um, if the part that went through in this clockwise direction will create these photon pairs that are linearly polarized in the same uh, direction, in this case horiz uh, horizontally polarized. And that is because the modulation instability phase matching the way it works is that the cross, the, the probability of scattering for the cross polarized photon is actually much smaller by a factor of nine less. Okay. The part that goes the other way uh, creates photon pairs that are then vertically polarized in this case. So now, if through heavy duty filtering, that turns out to be a, a, a crucial point here. If I separated these wavelengths by their uh, these photon pairs by their color, send the idler to one detector and the signal to another detector and ask the question, if I put polarization analyzers here and I look at all the counts that are on this detector, what polarization do they have? Or similarly for the other photon and what are their conditional uh, joint detection uh, correlations? And what you see is, what, uh, is this. That if you, uh, so this is relative angle between uh, uh, the angle of the polarizer that's in front of that detector. If you rotate it irrespective of the other, then there is no change. It behaves as if your detector is looking at photons that are, behave as they're unpolarized because you have an equally likely probability of a photon being generated clockwise or counterclockwise. So if they're clockwise, they're horizontal, counterclockwise, they're vertical. And so any detection, you can't tell what polarization it has. The same for the other. But if you ask the question that I detect the handedness of this uh, photon, I fix the polarization, now I rotate the other. Then, of course, you get this uh, full interference fringe because the two photons are generated together. If I know that this one is horizontal, the other one has to be horizontal. And uh, in fact, as you sweep, fix one polarizer, sweep the other, you can get this full two photon interference fringe. So this is the way we converted our energy time entanglement at, uh, in the photon pairs into polarization uh, entanglement. And of course, uh, this turns out to be uh, uh, pretty useful. We did a number of experiments to show that this kind of entanglement co can coexist in optical fibers. So here's, a, 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 an, again, a, a work some dates back to uh, OFC 2000. Six uh, post deadline, where we created this entangled photon pairs the way I described to you, and sent one of these photons to a fiber which was 50 kilometers long, the other fiber another 50 kilometers long, and here's the the channel plan on on these fibers. So the two quantum photon pairs occupied this frequency and this wavelength again dictated by the lasers we had. Okay. And we WDM'd in, muxed in, standard OC19 is 10 gigabit per second, on-off modulated uh, data channel. In one case, right next to it on the next telecom uh, channel. In the other case, we didn't quite have the laser, so it was a little bit further away. But the point here being that these photon pairs went into fibers that carried standard traffic. And at the output, using the telecom band components, you extract out the photon pairs, and you could still see high visibility two photon interference fringes. So this, these photons now, after being detected here, they're 100 kilometers apart. And this work has been taken to much higher levels, uh, again, uh, by many groups worldwide. The current record, I think, is about 300 kilometers. So you can send photon pairs 300 kilometers apart. They're completely dependent on losses that uh, you have a certain generation rate. Uh, the total loss, uh, because they're on, loss on either side matters, and your rate goes down, and you're, you can't really measure anymore because of dark currents that you have in your detectors. So they set the limit of how far you can go. Uh, and again, the same when you analyze the Chinese experiment with satellites, similar issues uh, come up, and, and you know, these kind of systems, uh, whether they are fiber-based or whether they are spontaneous parametric down-conversion-based, have come a long way in terms of in 
their application in engineered systems. And for us, uh, you know, we even commercialized a, a source like this. Uh, this is the company I had mentioned. Uh, uh, and you know, I would like to say that there are lots of customers, but you know, this is a nascent field. <laughs> I think I can count on my fingertips how many we've sold, but nevertheless, uh, it tells you, you know, what it takes to 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 uh, uh, to commercialize uh, things. The one advantage of having fiber-based sources is that you can run them at very high repetition rate. Same is true, actually, in spontaneous parametric down conversion as well, but. Controlling dispersions in crystals, it turns out to be much more challenging, partly because there's a lot of investment in fibers, I suppose. Uh, so in the case of fibers, uh, that source that I described to you ran at 50 megahertz. Those five picosecond wide pulses came every 20 nanoseconds. You compute the average power that was required, about two milliwatts, that led to about you know, 100,000 entangled pairs per second. Fibers can tolerate a lot more power than that. So if you just want to scale that to, to 10 gigahertz, it would require about 400 milliwatts of power. Uh, and uh, it turns out the bottleneck is not then the generation, it's the detection. Uh, the detectors, single photon detectors, have dead times for various reasons, uh, no matter which technology you look at, including you know, indium gallium arsenide based avalanche photodiodes or superconducting detectors, the rep rate is very, very low. So then one of the motivations for uh, looking at these kind of high rate systems or, or the switching technology that I want to introduce next is to demultiplex a high rate stream coming from a single source that you want to send to various different users. Another motivation that has been in the field, although we never did any work on this ourselves, was this um, high rate source uh, that was based on essentially parallelized system. In some ways, it's similar to what I described. Instead of multiplexing in time, this is multiplexed in space. So this uh, is attributed to Alan Migdal, where he thought about pumping many, many arrays of these spontaneous parametric down converters. These are Chi2 systems. And then the question was, you will detect one of those. And then depending on which of these detector fires, then you need some kind of a switch yard to, to route that photon through the switch yard to a single bus that comes out. And that way, you can multiplex, multiplex up the rate. In our case, we try to multiplex down the rate. Here, you multiplex up the rate. Uh, of course, the requirements that you want to have on these kind of switches are uh, very, very stringent. You want lossless, you want ultra-fast, no background, cheap, mass producible, and so on and so forth. And I want to show you that we hit many of the targets in the kind of switch I'm going to describe to you. And the switch, well, before I go into the nitty gritty details, uh, let me talk a little bit about uh, quantum switches in general. Because uh, we also talk about in, in, in quantum systems uh, controlled NOT gates and uh, qubit, two, two qubit gates and so forth. So typically, um, you can imagine uh, there are a device that's two input, two outputs. And with some kind of a control, you want to, uh, you want to put them in the cross state. In the quantum world, in the two qubit gates, you don't have this external. There the goal is to have the state of one of these inputs control the state of the other. So in that sense, this is a what we call um, in the quantum world, this would be called a Fredkin gate. So for us, I want to think of this control as a classical control. So think of it as a control plane uh, that's classically, and I can control, send uh, whatever instructions at different locations to have a particular switch be cross or bar. So, but when this switching occurs, it must have high switching contrast. That's obvious even for classical switches. 
it must not take a very uh, high control, whatever the power requirements uh, be here. So the threshold for this should be low. The, the true loss should be as small as possible. But, so these are completely classical, no different from classical. But the quantum one also requires that the quantum state of the input at port A or port B, that may be the state local or it may be an entangled state entangled with something else there. So when this switching occur, no degradation in that entanglement occurs. That is a very uh, severe stringent requirement. Uh, and, and of course, uh, that there should be no in-band loss, whether that comes from this pump or mixing of other channels. So there should be no in-band noise that's generated. Because in the end, these quantum states are single photon states. A qubit is nothing but a single photon. And if another photon got added, that completely destroys that state. One photon noise on a one photon signal is just too much. Uh, so, so, so these are the stringent requirements. And uh, the best system that I could think of at the time was the fiber itself because uh, the fiber has cross-phase modulation. It has dispersion. I can control things. Uh, so think of uh, our uh, switch as nothing but the plain old uh, cross-phase modulation uh, switch. In our case, implemented in a Sonyak loop environment. Uh, geometry, but you can do it as a Mach zender or any other interferometer like the one I've sketched here. So you have a, uh, an input. Actually, there are two inputs here coming in. And if there is no phase here, then I can define this to be the reference. As, so this is my uh, fiduciary state of this interferometer. When the pump comes in, I want to create a pi phase shift so that these two ports are switched. The trouble comes in uh, that uh, you want to do this in a way that does not disturb or change uh, the properties of this single photon uh, that's coming in. The single photon coming in has a certain wave function. Uh, it has a certain uh, entanglement property. So you want to be able to create the same phase shift at every point on, the, on this wave function. So our approach to this, and of course, then there are polarization issues because these are fibers uh, in which there's birefringence, there's all kinds of perturbations that come on the thing. So our solution to this was to create a pump pulse uh, that has a polarization state that rapidly evolves. So you can think of a pump that has two color components which are orthogonally polarized. And then as they go through, this pump is actually executing uh, kind of a very fast polarization rotation. And it has a uh, group velocity that's very different from a single photon or a probability amplitude that may be coming down the path on this side. So as it goes through, the cross-phase modulation creates the so-called, what we call, switching window. And if a photon happens to come along during that switching window, uh, it sees that phase shift. And if that, as it travels all the way through, so as you go through the fiber, the pump pulse walks right through, then at this output port, you have a uniform pi phase shift across the whole wave function profile. And then you have, uh, uh, for, a, for the appropriate pump power, you can get switching. And, and so, as, uh, so this is equivalent to this uh, uh, line switch. It's a one by two switch. Uh, we don't really have uh, an input here. But later on, I'll show you that we've built full two crossbar switches as well. Uh, there is a tremendous problem here, which has to do with uh, spontaneous Raman scattering. We know that in fibers, uh, uh, we have this Raman uh, spectrum. The glass consists of SiO2 molecules. They vibrate. And we use Raman amplifiers in telecom systems a lot. So 
in order to get this pi phase shift, you need a pretty intense pump. So you have to choose uh, your signals at the appropriate wavelength. So in our case, in the early experiments, we chose to create our entangled photon pairs in the so-called O-band, near 1310 nanometers. That's because uh, then all the, clearly we are uh, several tens of terahertz away uh, from where all the phonons assisted excitations are. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, the, the uh, anyway, it, it's far enough away that, uh, that it turns out that to not, not to cause, cause a problem. So here's uh, the source we built. Uh, again, this is uh, based on a Faraday mirror argument instead of the ones that I showed you before. Turns out to be pretty robust. The idea is the same. Pulse comes in. Uh, and there's a polarization dependent delay. We part, we break that pulse into two pieces. Upon reflection at this Faraday mirror, they reverse. Uh, and the, the, the point being that this fiber can float around and, and, and when it comes back and recombines, uh, it's a pretty robust and stable system. And here's the, the uh, uh, fidelity as measured through uh, polarization tomography as a pretty, you know, very stable source if you if you built it this way, and we've uh, characterized that. So this is time in hours. You can turn it on and off, go through the system. Looks pretty stable. And then we use this to show uh, that uh, you can do this switching with very high fidelity. So you measure. Uh, so you send one of these photons. Uh, to the switch. So you uh, first you, you know, create your reference port. Make sure that you have a a good uh, polarization, a good fidelity photon pair entangled in the polarization degree of freedom. Then we pick one of those photons and send it through the switch, and then we measure uh, the through tomography the polarization fidelity of the switched photon. And the results are, are shown here. So first of all, uh, just to characterize uh, uh, the switching contrast. So what is shown here is you change the pump pulse energy. So it is uh, written here as the energy carried by each of those uh, pulses. About a few nanojoules is what it took for the kind of uh, pump pulses, one nanometer bandwidth typically, uh, for those uh, uh, telecom band pulses. And uh, um, so there were two different results shown here for uh, 500 meter long fiber and 100 meter long fiber. The only difference you get by having a different length uh, is that uh, the delay that it causes uh, gives you the switching window. For the, so the switching window turns out to be essentially proportional to the length of the fiber. Uh, so here's an example of measuring uh, the entangled state fidelity passively, meaning that there is no pump pulse here active when the pump pulse is there, so the photon is switched. And you can see there's hardly any difference uh, between the two. So this, th this kind of a uh, cross-phase modulation-based switch then works as a uh, very good switch that preserves the entanglement fidelity. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, one can turn this into a full crossbar switch two by two uh, by using another circulator. So you can come in here, and as the pump goes through, both sides see the pi phase shift, and this output comes here, and this input uh, goes over there. And uh, in this case, uh, we used a very short piece of fiber, so about 20 meter fiber that gave, gave us a uh, 40 picosecond switching window. You can see that uh, uh, this uh, that the contrast is actually pretty good in in each case. Of course, uh, uh, one needs to uh, analyze as to what the limits are of this kind of a switch. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, cross phase modulation uh, uh, has been studied quantum mechanically from the early days of squeezing. Uh, in fact, uh, Herman House. Uh, and, and his students uh, uh, 
based on a theory that initially were pioneered by Peter Drummond, but nevertheless generalized uh, in the 90s to apply to this problem of Raman scattering in the, in the fiber. And uh, the details of this theory have been worked out, uh, including uh, the Raman scattering and also the time constants of uh, the, the phonons that are involved in the process. We took this theory and have generalized and applied to the case of this fiber. And I, although I'm not going to show you the results, but if you look in some of these papers, that the agreement with theory is, is exceptionally good without using any fitting parameters. Just the fiber parameters have been measured very, very accurately because of their use in telecom systems. So if you just use your experimentally measured values and the, the parameters that are available from the literature, you can do a, a essentially a, a fit to the data that requires no fitting parameters. So then the question is, uh, now that we have this switch, what can we do with it? And the first notion I want to show you is that of uh, the actual original motivation for creating a switch like this to demultiplex. Can we really do time division demultiplexing with this kind of a switch. And uh, to demonstrate that, we introduce this notion of this, uh, what I call quantum eye diagram. As you know, in classical system, we, we, we look at our system in terms of an eye diagram. If the eye is open, then the errors would be few. Can we have a, a similar notion of a, a quantum eye diagram? And so what we did in this case is created two quantum channels that are time division uh, apart, that, are, that time separated. In this early experiment, we didn't have that short uh, fiber uh, high speed switch yet. So these were done uh, when our switch was about 100 meter fiber. So in that case, we imagined a time slot, another time slot that was separated by about 300 picoseconds. So about three gigahertz kind of a overall system rate. And in one of these time slots, we created a quantum state, let's call psi 1, and I'll go into the details of what that is. In the other one, we created a state we call psi 2. These are independent states, distinct, independently measured. And then they are incoherent from each other. Okay, so if you do a, a relative delay, so you come in with a pump pulse and you put a relative delay, and you can see that you can separate these coincidence counts, uh, one of them earlier than the other. So this, you can think of it as that so-called quantum eye. It persists for about 100 picoseconds. Okay. So in order to demonstrate that this kind of a system can indeed do demultiplexing, so here's the, uh, the experiment that we, we did. So psi 1 is this HH plus VV state uh, that can be created uh, by, uh, by having a certain kind of a pump pulse, which is uh, polarization is, at, let's say, at 45 degrees. And if you do tomography of that, uh, you will get that these HH, uh, VV components, they all have equal heights. But if you can also create a state, what we call HH minus VV, in order to create this, you just have to, to change uh, the pump to be in a slightly different with a pi over, uh, pi over two phase shift. If you do that and do tomography on it, you find that these off diagonal terms turn out to be uh, negative, okay? But now, if you don't use the switch and just measure uh, the two, two ports directly, the single photon detectors don't have high temporal resolution. In fact, they integrate over much longer time spans. So when they measure this state, they measure both of these components together. So this incoherent mixture. And when now based on that, if you do tomography, you get results that's an incoherent mixture of these two components. On the other hand, if you now, um, so this is the result from the previous page. 
So if I can now come in and insert this switch in there so that the timing of the pump pulse overlaps with one of these, then, then I do tomography. I recover that fully uh, high fidelity HH plus VV state. And depend, you can park this uh, uh, either here or there. You will end up getting HH plus VV or HH minus VV. So this demonstrates that the system has enough temporal resolution to do to parse out uh, these kind of uh, time multiplex data streams. More recently, uh, we've been applying uh, these switches to uh, convert time wind entanglement into uh, to, uh, to do tomography on high dimensional time wind entanglement. Of course, uh, uh, it's debatable if uh, of what kind of an entanglement one would use in a, a real time of a network. Uh, most systems, uh, you know, it's hard to maintain polarization along along systems. Uh, so a lot of folks will argue that time wind entanglement is more suited for application in, in the conventional in, uh, network infrastructure. Uh, and then the question is, um, uh, because in the end the distance is limited by what we call photon loss, uh, you know, how far can you, can you send information, how much overall information you can communicate? Uh, so, so that uh, takes me to this uh, final uh, set of slides where we've been trying to create uh, again, this is uh, work at um, uh, the, in the O-band, 1305 nanometers. In this case, uh, we've come very tightly together, and we create uh, our um, uh, time bin entanglement by means of these 10 gigahertz pulse stream, which is pulse picked at that 50 megahertz rate. 50 megahertz because our detectors sync at 50 megahertz. That's the rep rate of our detectors. So we create, at a 50 megahertz rate, a pair of four pulses which maintain their coherence across this. And that comes about because we start from a, originally a CW laser which has a very long coherence time. And through this phase and amplitude modulation, we turn that into a, a pulse stream. And then uh, this kind of a pulse, as it goes through this single mode fiber, the same kind of source that I uh, described to you before, uh, spontaneous forward mixing occurs. And if I only have a photon pair here, you can't tell whether the photon pair got generated in the first time slot, second time slot, third or fourth time slots. In fact, depending on the coherence properties of this whole thing, you can extend that to as you know, very, very long pulses, uh, pulse sequences. Uh, so this is potentially capable of creating very large high dimensional entanglement. So, so in this particular case, then the question is, how do you show what fidelity of entanglement you have? So we've applied uh, this kind of a switch. Uh, and again, uh, this is uh, a little bit dense to understand, so I'm going to go through it a little bit slowly here. So what we do is that through certain, so in the end what you, en what you need to do is you need to create, you need to measure the entanglement between all these different time slots together between the two, two beams. So what we do is uh, 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 through a, a, actually I should, I should have kept one slide in here, let me just, sorry. I, the last minute I wasn't sure how long it's going to be so I took this out. Um, so what you do is you convert time bins into polarization by simply uh, splitting this uh, and then uh, coming, changing the polarization, putting the appropriate delay and coming through uh, a polarization beam splitter so that A and B modes in time overlap uh, into uh, a mode like this. And of course, necessarily, this kind of a system is lossy because you end up losing the photons that may arrive over here. Given that, uh, then what you end up doing 
is, uh, sorry about this, I should have kept that slide in there. Uh, so you end up uh, bringing your photons frame, put an appropriate delay, whichever one you want to measure. In this case, uh, two one uh, time slots here uh, and uh, three one, I'm sorry, zero two time slot here. And you arrange things in a way that in the passive state, passive meaning there's no pump pulse here, that this one uh, allows this to go through and this one allows this one to go through. Everything else is blocked. In that case, uh, then you, uh, when you apply the pump pulse, these two are switched and they go through. And then uh, you can do tomography on those polarizations. You converted those two time slots into polarization and then you apply the standard polarization tomography and then you have to uh, circle through all of those combinations. And in the end, you end up generating uh, the full tomography of this uh, Q-Quart uh, system. And of course, uh, I'm only showing you Q-Quart. Uh, if you look in this paper, we also do Q-Trait. We also do uh, more exotic states in which one of those components actually is negative. So that shows up just like in the two-qubit case, uh, uh, the one, few of those items are going negative. Uh, so this kind of a switch allows us to look at more uh, complicated high dimensional systems uh, for their quantum properties. So um, I think I want to sort of conclude here. I don't know how am I doing on time. Is it? Okay. So, um, so what I've shown you is uh, uh, a, an O-band entanglement switch uh, uh, that uh, it, it does, uh, you know, high fidelity switching of uh, O-band entanglement agrees with, with theory. Uh, there's neg negligible in-band noise. So the, the issue with Raman scattering is that, so you have this channel that you may have defined through nonlinear mixing, uh, whatever control you're using, it creates a photon that's actually in the same uh, space-time domain as, as your quantum signals may be, be going through. Uh, we've demonstrated that you can do uh, uh, high-quality uh, muxing, demuxing of uh, the data patterns, and we've shown one application of it in this uh, uh, high-speed time bin uh, uh, tomography of QDIT systems, uh, QDIT three, 2, 3, and 4, although I didn't show any results on, on 3. Potentially a very low loss. Our current design of the switch is not that low loss because those circulators that we have in this Sonia configuration turn out to be quite lossy. In a, in a circulator, every pass you make through it, it's about uh, four tenths to half a dB of loss. So overall, this, the, currently the way we've designed the switch is lossy, but if you go to uh, a simple Mach Zander kind of a design, uh, with a, some kind of a, a laser beam to, to stabilize the two paths, uh, this system actually uh, can be quite low loss. Uh, one switching cycle of about 0.2 or 0.3 dB of loss total. And in fact, there's an SBIR at the company right now to demonstrate uh, this low loss version of this kind of a switch. I showed you that... Um, for the lab experiments, since our pump pulses were available to us in the telecom band, you need a fairly high peak powers, uh, the two nanojoules per pulse. That tr translates into a, a fairly high peak power. So for us to create a quantum channel, then we had to go to this O band. So we are far away in the anti-Stokes side of this uh, Raman scattering peak. Clearly, at O band, the loss in the fiber is larger than the, than the C band. So if one were to build a network, even though O band is not used, uh, but it's, its range is going to be very limiting. So in fact, you want to create a switching of entanglement generated in the C band uh, itself. So for that, uh, there are several approaches. One approach is to create the pump 
at around 2 microns. Now, there are fibers. There is similar kind of infrastructure becoming available around 2 microns that can then be used as a pump for switching uh, C-band entanglement in the 1.55 micron region. Also, serendipitously, we found that, uh, again, this is some work at, at the company through this SBIR, that to, to very efficiently switch C-band entanglement, just one micron pump works. So for one micron pump, even though you're on the, uh, you're on the Stoke side, but the frequency separation is so large, you're way up beyond that. Okay, and that also works. And uh, when we were designing our experiments, that never occurred to me that, okay, that will work as well. But we'll see how far that work goes. If that works out, then that would be actually be a, uh, could be a potentially cost-effective way of doing things. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, utilizing these kind of switches to do some early stage experimentation of uh, uh, quantum networks uh, uh, is useful. And in fact, um, uh, this uh, Air Force Research Lab in Adelphi, uh, you know, they have uh, put together a small scale quantum network based on the technologies that I've shown you. Uh, the entanglement sources, uh, uh, the switches and the detectors, they're all you know, purchased from based on the technologies that I've described. Um, I think I, uh, if, let me take a break here and, and see if you have any questions and then I want to talk a little bit more about the quantum frontier uh, from a, a different perspective. If time permits, I'm not sure of who's watching the time here. Yes. To the thing, everyone's, um, <laughs> um, what challenges exist in entangling states in polychromatic light? Polychromatic light. Um, I think it should be possible. I, mean, I don't see why not. Um, I'm reminded of the, uh, the very first experiment actually I did when I moved to Northwestern. Uh, the question I had posed to myself back then, uh, coming from MIT, doing the early work on squeezing, uh, the work that our group was doing there was through four-way mixing in sodium vapor at the time, right? So this was the early 80s. Uh, Kimball was doing parametric uh, uh, subthreshold parametric amplifiers. Mark Levinson was doing in fibers, and you know we were pursuing sodium vapor. So I asked myself, uh, why do I need coherent light to squeeze? Why can't I squeeze incoherent light? Okay, and in fact, we did experiments. We showed that there is actually not there's nothing that says that you couldn't squeeze any mode. I mean, e so you can think of uh, polychromatic light so long as I have a certain defined mode. I should be able to create entanglement. I should be able to do squeezing. I should be able to do everything. So in principle, yes. It turned out to be harder because, it's, anyway, this is a long story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm curious why it was more difficult. Oh, because controlling. So, uh, so we were using a Q-switched mode locked laser. Uh, actually, so a Q-switched laser to start out. We went to mode lock later. So what happens is when, so our model of an incoherent light was that you have a Q-switch pump. As you know, in Q-switching, the pulse starts are randomly every shot, right? So, um, so then you, uh, you do same parametric down conversion in our case in a traveling wave. There's no cavity. And then you have a local oscillator and you try to measure squeezing. Uh, and this was type 2 down conversion, and so we will do the appropriate mixing and so forth. So now what happens is that in Q-switch lasers, once in a while there's accidental mode locking. And we were burning our crystals left and right. <laughs> so you will set the experiment up for some average power, and once in a while there will be accidental mode locking. The intensity will just go through the roof, and you know you see a little burn on the crystal. Uh, but nevertheless, we managed to do experiments. We saw squeezing. 
Now, squeezing gets limited because how do you measure that squeezing? So what is the optimum local oscillator? And this is a conversation Paul Yes and I were having earlier in, in terms of how you got squeezing I created in a mode, you know, what is the optimal mode? So that was also an issue. So after this early work, we went to Q switch mode lock because the modes get defined much more. The system becomes very stable and controllable. Anyway, so it's a long-winded answer. Oscillations from the energy and how the coupling or switching energy would allow us to switch the states. But it looked like on the very end of this pump pulse energy that it was starting to oscillate back down. Have you taken those me measurements to see if it ends up being a sign of the oscillation or if it ends up leveling out? Uh, it does. It does come down. So it's very hard to go away. So again, I. I didn't put in, I uh, wasn't sure how much technical detail it was meant to be a colloquium. So, so that's a very good question and, and opens up a, a, a line of inquiry. So what happens is that these pump pulses uh, with that two nanojoule or so roughly of uh, energy, in the bandwidth they have, this is a very, very high order soliton actually because we're in the uh, 1.5 micron region, zero dispersion is at 1.3, so we're in the anomalous dispersion region, and we have simulations, and in fact, uh, as I said, uh, this, we collaborated with a uh, classical nonlinear optics person, and we did simulations. So these pump pulses, as they cross through, as they go through, they are getting compressed and they, you know, this, this, this is a, I don't know, 40th order soliton that's breaking up. But the, the beauty is that the single photon wave function comes, marches along. So long as it goes through the whole thing, every point on that wave function profile sees the same cross phase shift. And you get uh, high quality switching. But the pump itself, uh, its dynamics is, is uh, uh, so we've analyzed it in the detail. I can share with you some of those papers if you like. Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> professor. <laughs> I wanted to ask, so how would the distortion on the pump profile induced by cell free modulation or distortion affect the performance of the switch? So as I mentioned, uh, so long as uh, you uh, I can show you some simulations we've done. Uh, th this pump really breaks up. But so long as you go through the whole thing, uh, the switching quality is actually very good. And we've, we've done it for different kinds of fibers I mean, in simulations uh, and shown that uh, uh, if, yeah, so, I mean, so long as you... I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it, I, maybe that's why it works better with one micro. I have a similar question then on the, uh, so all, all your multiplexing here is in the time domain for the reasons you said, and, and your switch is a time domain switch, but, but you could multiplex in the frequency. Sure, absolutely. Just filtering and yeah. use your parametric fluorescence. Mm -hmm. um, People have done that. But, but is there an equivalent switch? Uh, uh, you mean if you have a, a entanglement that's in frequency? No, I'm not aware of if you if you have entanglement in frequency components. Uh, the the yeah, if you have entanglement in in many many multiple wavelengths, then I don't know. Uh, I do not know the answer. Yes. Does it work um, being done to get uh, detectors that have a shorter dead time? Yes. In fact, that was the whole goal of <laughs> this DARPA program that I, I started at the very end. Uh, the best 
Oh, so, sorry. Two, two different, uh, I think I was going to answer the wrong question, but <laughs> you had something different, the dead time. Um, the, the problem with uh, most detectors is that you need to classicalize this one excitation that occurs. So in the case of indium gallium arsenide, you have a single photon creating electron hole pairs that need to be amplified and so forth. In the process, it creates traps. The charge gets trapped and there's after pulsing and the whole kind of slew of issues that come up. So you have to wait. Okay. So even though, that's why I was going to answer the wrong question first, even though you have a, a very high rise time, so you could discriminate arrival of photons to like 50 picoseconds, but then you have to wait for a very long time. In the case of the detectors we're using because of these charge trapping issues. Similar thing occurs even in uh, superconducting nanowire based single photon detectors. Uh, you have these hot spots that are formed, superconductivity break, takes a while for this to restore the equation state. Okay. So, so in the end, it is a catastrophic event when when uh, you classicalize this one quantum excitation. And um, yes, people have tried to push it. Uh, the number resolving detector that are based on this transition edge technology that are even slower. Uh, but the fastest I, I know of uh, is, uh, oh, so there is another approach actually. So this is called sinusoidal gating. That's another approach in which uh, instead of uh, uh, having, putting a gate as a pulse, you sinusoidally drive the system and you drive it such that uh, instead of continuously being open, you have windows. And uh, if photon happens to arrive there, then your ability to uh, measure gets better and, and you can get to where, so you may be running, the fastest I know of is like 1.5, 1.25 gigahertz. Uh, and then uh, about four to five of those cycles later, you're ready to detect another photon. So that's, uh, they can be uh, 10 nanoseconds, I guess, on that order. So. I'm not sure if anybody, actually, uh, Frank, uh, Sakad may know. Uh, Franco did uh, some experiments uh, where they had the rate, actual counting at very high rate. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think it's approaching 100 megahertz or even mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah. That was, uh, yeah. The yeah, it was sinusoidally yeah. gated at that, uh, but uh, anyway, so it is possible to, to go to higher rates than that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So basically, when these two pulses overlap, you have a mm, switching window, right? So, but you said that the the pulse duration is around five picosecond, but the switching in there is like 150 picosecond. Is it because of the dispersion in five Yes. So, so this is uh, uh, somewhat uh, tricky, right? So you want. So when when we say that uh, there is a a arrival of a photon, you don't know where it is. First of all, right? So so what you need to create is that uh, as, the, as the pulse goes through, the quantum channel comes at a different speed, but in the end, there's a time slot. If there was a photon, if it arrived in that time slot and the pump had given that phase shift, it would switch. So, so the time slot is then the relative delay between the group velocities of the two, two pulse streams. So between 1.3 micron and 1.5 micron, it's about two, what was the number? It's, uh, it's two picosecond per meter, I think. 
So you can think of it as a pump as it uh, as is going through. It leaves behind a trail uh, of time in which uh, there is that phase cross phase exists. Yes. Like more technical question. So uh, so uh, how is the extinction ratio of the WDM? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you need to use multiple WDMs to completely eliminate the pump Um. So there, there, there can be. So these WDMs typically have like 30 dB type of. Uh, so whatever is left behind that comes in eventually gets blocked by the filters you have. So you know 30 dB down is is we've never had any issue with like leaking through here, because this then is, uh, there are filters at 1.3 micron. That we have to custom make. I mean, nobody sells these WDMs at 1.3 micro. We had to go and have them custom made. Uh, yeah, that that was never. We just. I I don't think we used multiple. Just one was enough here, a 30 dB. Yes. So, uh, so the the you don't have to use an all optical switch, right? You can just any. You're using that because you want the speed. And yeah. And you don't want to use an SOA because that would be a mess with not on the air. Yeah, just, uh, you know, it depends on what one wants to do. Uh, you could use an electro-optic device. In fact, I had a conversation, uh, I had a call from um, the Reiner Blotz group. Uh, they wanted, they wanted, they're creating these calcium ions, uh, photon pairs, they want to switch. And after having a call with them and looking at their numbers, they were thinking of implementing something in the fiber. It just makes no sense. I mean, their photons were 10 microseconds long. I mean, there's just no way that uh, this kind of a thing is going to. It's be very hard to build a 10, you know, microsecond long switching window. Yeah. So I think, uh, for example, in their case, the simple electro, -op even a bulk electro optic thing, will be the best thing to do. You can get very little loss, and you know. Uh, with 10 microsecond long, uh, maybe they're, you know, any power supply will, will give them a nice, nice response. 